Yo lo considero la tierra y yo lo amo a la tierra como si fuera mi madre. Nuestras aguas es nuestra vida. Yanacocha is one of the largest gold mines in the world. Like a pyramid downwards. They have a tremendous impact on communities that depend on the land for survival. Mining operations are impossible with human presence there. They need Maximas Lea. Que todo lo que es la laguna es puro oro. Si yo dejo esta tierra, la empresa se va a quedar acá y esta tierra se va a quedar un desierto. The company continues to claim that it's their land, she doesn't have the right to be there. You can't use violence against a family with whom you have a land dispute. Señores, por favor, necesito apoyo, necesito ayuda, miren acá como están. Y lo veo aquí, tirado, en el piso. No quieren dejar el precedente de que una mujer campesina les puede torcer el brazo. Peru is one of the most dangerous countries for human rights activists. She became a very visible person for human rights movement. Yo he nacido en el campo, y en el campo voy a morir. No será malo estar con el sombrero. Mejor se saca su sombrero. Me encontré alegre, pero como no sé leer. Yo soy una jaqueñita. Que vivo en las cordilleras. Que vivo en las cordilleras. It's not just about her family's land, but people who might be in similar situations all over the world. Yo defiendo la tierra. Hello and welcome to the 206 podcast. My name is Mark. I'm coming to you from Seattle, Washington, and this is the Changing Directions podcast series. Joining me for this episode is award-winning filmmaker, Claudia Sparrow. Claudia, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, thank you for having me today. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for taking the time. I appreciate you being here. Now, we're here to talk about your documentary, Maxima. So please describe the story. And when did you first discover Maxima Acuna, the woman who is the subject of the film? Uh, yes, definitely. So the film tells the story of Maxima Cunha. She's a Peruvian activist. She's this outstanding woman who is standing up to the largest coal producer in the world, uh, which is a U.S. corporation. And she's standing up in defense of her land and resources that hundreds of thousands of people depend on to survive. And she basically represents the fight that activists are facing around the world, really. Um, so I, that's why I think her story is so, so timely and, and so important. Sure. Now, when you decided that you wanted to make a documentary about her, what was that outreach like? Because I would imagine the process of getting an approval, even to pitch the idea, would be, you know, maybe difficult given the circumstances. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and you mentioned um, it was actually, first of all, I'm, I'm a fiction filmmaker. So um, ironically, if you had asked me if I would ever work on a documentary a few years ago, I would have told you, no, absolutely <laughs> no. Right, right. You know? No, because I didn't like documentaries. It was just not my focus. Mm. But that all changed the day that I came across Maxim's story, which was mm. back in 2016. Um, I was just so moved by her strength, her courage, her story, what she had been basically fighting against since 2011. Um, and I literally couldn't sleep. I was like, okay, you know, I'm a Peruvian filmmaker. She's Peruvian. Like there is something I, I can do to just give her voice a larger platform. And that's basically how it all started. I read an article about her. So I contacted the journalist, uh, Joseph Saturday. He's uh, an amazing uh, writer, by the way. And he put me in touch with Maxima's lawyer, Mirta Vasquez. But it was definitely a it was a month long process because um, this, um, her lawyer Maxima are in Cajamarca, which is a city 
that is uh, in the Andes of Peru. And so um, specifically, sometimes to reach Maxima's lawyer, who is a human rights rights activist. She's very busy. She, mm. she was also a teacher. So I would like just call a million times a day. <laughs> and they're, both, they're like, oh, you know, she's not available. She'll be available in 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Or she called back. Like, it took months, I think, for for her to finally take up the phone. And I'm, so, I'm like, I'm like, Claudia, who you don't know. And, <laughs> and, you know, the story was also, she was she had a lot of people obviously approaching her because of Maxima. Mm. So, Luckily, one day she took the call and I told her, listen, I want to tell her story. And it was a process for her to obviously talk to Maxima and just get her permission. And fast forward many months later, finally, Maxima agreed to just have us come uh, to her land and just let us do a, an interview and, you know, just kind of um, a research trip. And that is how it all started. Oh, that's amazing. Now, over the course of filming the documentary, uh, you know, obviously you're interacting with Maxima and she seems just like an amazing person. Did you really get to know her well? And what was that experience like of interacting with her while filming? Yeah, it, it was it was surreal. I mean, she's just such a wise, powerful woman, but also like such a, um, a wholesome person. Right. And you know, it was it was just like such an honor every time. Like she just has this beautiful energy. She's very welcoming. She's very charismatic, and you know, she's the kind of person where like if you are a total stranger and you go to her home, she's gonna open the doors to her home, <laughs> let you stay. She's gonna offer you her bed. She's gonna feed you, <laughs> even though you know that is a challenge for her and her family. Like she's just that kind of person. Wow. We makes it makes it the more heartbreaking seeing you know what she's had to face. Um, and so I, I like to see that I got to know her well enough to um, just really understand that what she was fighting for. Like, it, it just comes from a very genuine place. Right. And, you know, she's really ultimately doing it because she believes that, you know, without water and land, there is no, no, no point to life. Like for her, this, are, this is like sacred. L land is you know, worth dying for. Protecting the water is worth dying for. And she really, for her, is like, they are like her, her mother. So, you know, that's how she approaches them. She, she treats them. And it's just like, a, it was just to me, a life-changing experience because having grown, been born and raised in, in the city where there is not a very a strong connection to nature. Mm. Um, it was just a beautiful reminder like an, an eye-opening experience of like oh you know how we've forgotten to ask ourselves basic questions such as like where is our food coming from where's our water coming from what happens a day that is no longer accessible you know and, and it's not so unlikely that's a really good point that you bring up and I, I feel in watching the documentary you did a great job of presenting her how you just described like she's a caretaker of the lands and in return the lands take care of her and her family so you know job well done on on uh, bringing her to life in the documentary now Claudia you are from Peru as you mentioned so I've, I'm guessing Maxima's story and the environmental issues you bring up really hit home in that respect so what does it mean for you to be able to get this story out there for the world to see it really means the world. I know that, um, I mean, I, I've done a few projects and I hope I, I hope I continue to spend the rest of my life telling stories, but I also know that this film is always going to be so important, maybe the most important one, because obviously it affects real people and I right. feel like it can really make a difference. So it's, it's, it's a dream, it's, it's, a, it's a huge honor. Um, as you mentioned, I am Peruvian, but even as a Peruvian, I had no idea that this was happening mm. in my country. Um, uh, at the at the hands of a U.S. corporation, and you know, I, again, I think it's just a story that really represents uh, a problem that is happening everywhere, and most people don't know about it. Uh, even Peruvians, like you know, when I talk to them about this uh, conflict, they just have no idea about it. So once they saw the film, they were very thankful and appreciative that oh, you know, I, I had no idea. Like now, now I want to be able to do something about it. Oh, that's great. And you're, you're absolutely right. This isn't just about Peru. This isn't just about one woman's struggle. It's about corporate greed on a global scale and just the total disregard for both people and the environment. Now, your documentary shows how one woman can make a difference, but what can we do on a larger scale to protect lands and the people who live on them? You know, I, I think it, it, the, the easiest thing, I think, or like the, one, the thing that, is, uh, um, that we all have control over is 
Should we who we choose as our representatives? Mm. You know, we forget that we have a very strong vote. Um, we have a lot of power by who we vote. Right. Um, we always have the power of organizing, you know, within our communities, even with family, friends. Um, what I learned is that corporations really value their PR a lot. Mm. And so they'll go to like great extents to cover up any misbehavior or abuse that they're committing. So I think that just, you know, talking about it publicly, denouncing it publicly, like it does have a lot of effect. So I think that if you, if there is a cause that you're passionate about or that you care about, you know, there are a lot of organizations that um, support activists like Maxima. So, you know, you can literally just be in front of your computer and like share with social media, you can mm -hmm. sign petitions, um, you can get out there and just donate your time, donate money. So I think that, you know, every little step counts. Oh, that's great. Thank you for, for explaining that. Now, you had mentioned a moment ago that previous to the documentary, you do fictional stories as a narrative storyteller. So from a filmmaker perspective, as a director, what was the biggest challenge for you while making this film? Um, you know, the, the, having the, your, the, changing your chip, I guess, because mm -hmm. coming from fiction, you're used to like having control over the uh, shots and the look and the lighting and you can rehearse <laughs> the actors and you know redo re another take mm -hmm. and that goes out the window <laughs> when wow, you're yeah. the center. it's like um you know you just sometimes have to make a decision like in a split of a second and if you miss that critical moment you missed it because you mm -hmm. cannot you know redo it and and then just really 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 trust in your instinct because again you're just docu documenting a journey so um you know you just like do your best to like get the moments that you think are important right there and then. Um, and again, hope that you are, you, you are there uh, covering the, the moments that are gonna be key for the story. So, um, I mean, I, I think as a, from a filmmaker standpoint, like it just, I'm, it's thing, I feel it made me a lot braver because <laughs> I just I was forced to, you know, again, make decisions and, and just like think and move quickly. I know it sounds like this was a big learning experience for you then. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So what is something that you learned from making the documentary that you're now going to take into every picture you make moving forward? <laughs> um, I, I think, like, again, just really, really trusting my instinct and maybe mm. not obsess over things that don't seem as important anymore. Like, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's things like just maybe even just a setup, like... Um, little details that now I, I feel like, no, you know, like you really have to focus on the, in the bigger picture right. and even how you tell them. I feel like with documentary, um, you know, just the, the, the approach, like maybe it's not so perfect visually, but maybe it's a more powerful angle. Like it just, it just, it just made me explore and experiment hmm. as a filmmaker. And I feel like I am I'm ready to, to bring all of that to, to fiction. Oh, that's great. It sounds like you've got a good path moving forward for you. So what is something that you look back on about making this movie that really just gives you a sense of gratitude? Um, I think it's just the overall experience of having been able to tell Maxima's story. Mm. Um, you know, again, it, it was just an honor. Um, and it was it was her, it was also her lawyer, uh, Mirta Vasquez in Peru, also her lawyers in, in D.C. Um, they are just doing this outstanding work yeah. and and i feel just to be able to have to have had the opportunity to just share it be with them you know document it learn about their work um it, it it's it made me my life better so i'm just very um i'm just very thankful that i got to do it and that i get to share to share that with the world oh that's great thank you now are there filmmakers that you feel have had an influence on your career you know ones that inspire your work um, definitely. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm, the first one that just came to mind was, um, Pedro Almodovar. I've always been, yeah, a, yeah. yeah um, I, I mean, I'm also a big <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock fan. Okay. Um, so I, I, I naturally gravitate, I guess, which again is very different from documentary, but, <laughs> um, I just, I just tend to like, like psychological thrillers mm -hmm. or drama or, or, or experiences that are intense, I guess. That's where I tend to, to go. No, oh, absolutely. Yeah, those are two great examples to, to draw from. Thank you. Uh, who inspires you that's not a filmmaker? Who inspires you? I mean, now I'm going to say, again, it's 
I'm just going to say like activists, mm, activists yeah. like Maxima. And, you know, maybe it's not somebody who labels act like themselves as activists, but who are like making an effort to um, just talk about important issues. And, you know, and, and that can be just not just em environmental, uh, you know, politics, um, just anybody who is really standing up to talk about issues that are important that are maybe not getting um, mainstream attention. Like I really, really admire them because it's, it's not it's not easy and you know many of them are sometimes risking their own lives um to do that oh definitely so I, love so, I, so I love to read stories about that people trying to make a difference in whatever field they are working on oh nice well i feel with this documentary you're making a difference so that's a that's a great example thank you now yes. you've won yeah, you've won several awards at different festivals since premiering back in April of 2019 at the Hot Docs Festival in Canada. Now, I first saw the film during Slam Dance in 2020, which oh, was wow. one of the yeah, it's one of the last festivals that took place before COVID shut everything down. Yes. So, Claudia, what has the film festival experience been like for you since the pandemic basically changed not just film festivals but the entire world? Absolutely, that's great to know. You saw it at Slam. It was, it was like you say, it was one of the last. I think maybe the the, the last festival I went also with the film. Oh, wow. um, yeah, um, you know, we we in a way, I'm gonna say, um, I'm gonna say lucky because we got to experience the in person experience with Maxima right. uh, in festivals, uh, and then we also got to to experience the virtual experience uh, during the pandemic. And even now we still have, um, the films are still screened at some festivals um, and virtual events. And, you know, it was different, but it also, I feel like made me realize that on the positive side, how remote virtual um, events allow you to right. reach maybe more more people who, are, who otherwise wouldn't be able to attend. Um, and, you know, and while, that was, while that was different, I feel like it was very powerful too. Um, of course, it's, you know, I, I do love being able to be in person, especially with audiences and like right. talk to them in Q and A's. But then again, when we've been able to do it remotely, um, we were able to have people, you know, look from the US and Europe, um, um, you know, even like Australia, Latin America, like at the same time. And, and that I felt like was very powerful. And as an independent filmmaker, that also, you know, can just open doors when you are when you have like budget constrictions. Right. So that was on the positive side. Oh, definitely, thank you. Now, what type of feedback do you get after the screenings of the films? Very, very, very positive, which nice. is which is being, uh, and I have to say it was surprising because um, we didn't know, like when we first premiered mm. Hot Dogs, we had no idea how audiences were gonna take it. Uh, if they were gonna see it like, oh yeah, the story of this woman who is like so far away, but it was all the opposite. You know, people really, really connected to her story, to her fights, really saw the bigger picture, um, you know, the, the reality that she represents. And it's just been overwhelming, overwhelmingly just beautiful and, and empowering. And, and I think it's what pushes, keeps pushing my team and I to keep fighting for the film. Um, and, you know, make sure, try to make sure that it gets out and as many people as possible can see it more on a, on a mainstream level. But it's been, it's been, that has been so beautiful to just see the, how her story affects and inspires people. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you. And I think a lot of that should be owed to, as I mentioned before, how you present Maxima in the documentary, you really humanize her, you really allow the viewers to get to know her. So was that something you were really mindful of as you were filming and as you were editing and, and putting the film together? You know, from the moment I first saw her um, on screen, like because, um, you know, before I even contacted her, I just find her so, um, so incredibly powerful and, and, and engaging. And so I, f I always felt like if I get to tell her story, that's, you know, that's what I want to do, just be able to mm. portray her and document her and her her world, her life, her fight. And so that was always the goal. Um, and I think she, you know, she got to see it actually at Hot Dogs and to oh, really? see her agree and see like, yeah, this is, you know, it was painful for me. You know, Maxima said that to relive this, but I do feel that it represents my journey. So, mm. so that was like the best compliment ever. Oh, that had to be just like the ultimate validation right there. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, that was the, worth everything. 
Uh, that's amazing. Thank you. Now, the last thing we see in the documentary is the phrase, the fight continues, meaning Maxima's court cases are far from over, her story is far from over. It's just going to be an ongoing battle. So can you talk about that a little bit of um, just there's not really like a beginning and an ending in the documentary that this isn't over. Like what, what's like what's moving forward for for Maxima? Yes, um, absolutely. Unfortunately, uh, and we always knew this, as this was not going to be um, a short fight. I mean, mm -hmm. it's firing in 2011. It is ongoing. Um, again, this is a citizen um, and actually like a vulnerable citizen who is fighting the largest coal producer in the world, um, you know, a massive corporation. And so, um, of course, they have a lot of resources to take on as many legal fights and, and just stretch them as much as possible. And he, her case, um, you know, that, that is the reality of, of her case. So um, the case was brought to the US and the case was um, appealed a couple of times. The, her, the latest I know is that her, her team is reviewing um, what, what makes sense um, because the, the last appeal was rejected. So they are just basically um, looking into what options are left because the goal is for the trial to take place in the US. Mm. That is where the company is, is based and, um, and formed. So that is basically where they could be held accountable. Right. So that is the goal. And so we're hoping that that can happen. And of course, this is in the US. In Peru, she also has a couple more um, lawsuits that are ongoing. So it's, it's going to take um, COVID put it slow things down so right. it's gonna just be a long journey well wow, thank you for for the update on that now for more information and progress updates people can go to standwithmaxima.com so what can people do right now if they want to get involved I, I know there are some resources on the website yes so um we you can sign a petition um asking the the company to stop all the harassment um and the lawsuits against Maxima, um, you can donate. We have a GoFundMe campaign. So all, all funds go directly to the family to support their livelihood while they are um, in this legal fight. Um, and then you, you, know, you can also host, if you're interested, host a film if you are uh, you know, part of a school organization or even maybe with friends and family, like all, all of that uh, helps us build awareness and uh, which, which is which is the goal for the film. Excellent, thank you for that. Now, Claudia, thank you for taking the time to speak with me. I wish you and Maxima the film and Maxima the person all the best in the future. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, I really appreciate it. My name is Mark, this is Claudia Sparrow. Her documentary is Maxima, and this is the Changing Directions podcast series. For those watching on YouTube, please hit the like button, subscribe to the page, and leave a comment. If you're listening to the podcast, please subscribe, and you can also leave a review on iTunes. Any way you can support the podcast is very much appreciated. All my interviews and all my movie reviews are available on 206.com. Links are in the description below. Thank you so much, be safe, and see you next time.